Well, good to be with you all today. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah, it's a beautiful day outside. I hope you guys all had a great week. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. If you're new here, my name is Drew. I'm the lead pastor here at Forefront, and we are just so glad you guys came to worship with us this morning. Hey, if you guys have your Bibles with you, I invite you to grab those, and let's open up to the book of Isaiah. We're going to go Old Testament today. I recently read a book called Uncaged by a guy named, by the name of Judd Wilhite. He's a pastor in Las Vegas. And he tells this story about a guy named Gary Richman who worked at the L.A. Zoo. And uh, Gary Richman was, was kind of looking around the back room one day, and he, and he noticed this cage full of red-tailed hawks. And I guess the story was that they had been part of a defunct poaching case, and so they, they, they couldn't be on dis, put on display. And so Richmond knew, working at the zoo, that if these hawks continued to live in these cages, that they, they wouldn't live, that they were going to die in captivity. So he decides to accidentally leave the door of the cage open. So he leaves for about an hour, and he comes back, but he's really shocked to see that the hawks are still in the cage. So he, he thinks, okay, well, I'm going to try to scare him out. So he balls up like a bear, and he runs at him and yells, and the, the hawks jump out of the cage, and they move a few feet away. But then, instead of flying off, they just look back at the cage. And he's like, this is really weird. So then he starts yelling at him. He starts yelling at him. He's like, what are you guys doing? He said, don't, don't you see the sky? Don't you want to be free? He said, God gave you a purpose. Now go and fulfill it. Well, the Red Hawks kind of just looked at him like, I don't have any idea what you're saying. And eventually he just herds them back into the cage because none of them budged. And, and it was kind of a shocking thought for him. And it leads us to the question, why did these hawks not fly away? Why did they stay in the cage? I don't know about you guys, but anytime I opened the door, my dog just took off, right? He wanted to get out as fast as he could. So why would these hawks, who were meant to fly, born to be free, want to stay in this cage? And what he figured out was that they had gotten so used to the cage life that they, they had forgot what freedom felt like, that they were too afraid of what was on the other side, of what was out there. They were too afraid of the uncertainty, and because of that uncertainty, it led them to a place of fear. And they chose the cage over freedom. And unfortunately, I think for many of us, whether we realize it or not, we make the same trade every day. Because the truth is, we live in a world that is full of uncertainty. We battle uncertainty at work. You know, there's fear over what's going to happen Maybe hey, there's, a, there's been a corporate merger or there's a new boss that's been hired and we are uncertain of what's going to happen. There's this fear. We, we don't know what's going to happen. What, what happens when I make a mistake? or What happens if I don't get this sale or if I don't meet my quota? What's going to happen next? There's uncertainty. We face uncertainty also when it comes to our health. You go in for your yearly checkup and the doctor tells you, hey, something came back on that test that was a bit unnormal. We want to run some more tests. That is about the scariest thing you can hear. Because now you have to wait in this uncertainty, in this tension. You're wondering, what's going to happen? What's next? What's the test going to show? Can I pay for it? Am I going to be able to recover? What's going to happen? We, ha we face uncertainty when it comes to our relationships. We wonder, you know, what's going on? Maybe I'm in a shaky season in, in a relationship with a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or in your marriage, and you're wondering, what's going to happen? How is this all going to come together? Maybe you're having a tough time with your kids as they're growing up, or maybe you're having um, a fallout with a friend, and you're just wondering, what's going to happen? There's so much uncertainty around it. Just turn on the news. There's so much uncertainty politically. I mean, we live in a world with uh, political unrest all around us. And we wonder, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with the next election? What's going to happen with this country we live in? And too often, this uncertainty in our lives, no matter what it is, leads us to a place of fear. We find ourselves in a, in a place where we're afraid. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid and I'd do something I knew I shouldn't have done, and I heard my mom or dad, I would take off, beeline from my room, and what would you do? Slam the door and then what? Lock it, Right? Lock the door because you don't know what mom or dad's coming to say. They may be coming to lay the, the law down. And they may be just coming to coach you up. But you don't know. There's that uncertainty. So I'm scared. I'm going to lock the door and I'm going to hide under my bed. So I don't, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I had some stuff under the bed because I spent a lot of time there. <laughs> but see, I think uncertainty does this to us. It leads us in a place of fear. We end up freezing up. And we are afraid of what's on the other side. And so we end up getting comfortable in the cage or locking ourselves in our rooms. But what I want us to see, church, is that God did not design us to live this way. God did not design you to live behind a locked door or in a cage. God designed you to be free. I like what Judd Wilhite 
says. He says that we forget that Jesus didn't just die to save us from our sins. He died to save us to a brand new life, a life free from worry, fear, shame, and condemnation. And it reminds me of the words of Jesus in John 10, in verse 10. Jesus says that I have come so they may have life and have it in abundance. See, Jesus came to give us life, to show us what freedom looks like, so that we can be free in him. And if you know Jesus, you've been saved to a brand new life. That's what we celebrated last week, church. The empty tomb means a new life, a brand new life, one where you don't have to be afraid, one where uncertainty doesn't have to lead us down the path of fear. So I think the question we have to ask is, this, this life of freedom, this abundant life that Jesus talks about, what does it look like? And how do I get there? So this morning, I'm really excited for us to kick off a new series called The God of the Promise. And over the next seven weeks, we're going to look at seven promises that God gives us to help us see that he is trustworthy and that as we cling to those promises, we have a strong foundation for life and when we come upon the storms of life. You know, it's really interesting. If you open up your Bible, Old Testament, New, and count up all the promises God gives us in his word, there's more than 7,000 promises in God's word. 7,000. That's incredible, an incredible number to think about. And this morning, I want want us to see that God gives us these promises to help us to be uncertain or to help us be certain of his love in times of uncertainty. And, And this is the purpose of the series. So over the next seven weeks, we're going to talk about how we can step out from that locked door, how we can step out of the cage and begin to understand that there are power in the promises of God. So I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, it's interesting. As you read through your Bible, we see over and over God's people or people that found themselves in overwhelming situations, situations of uncertainty. I mean, go all the way back to the book of Genesis, and you see that God tells, um, tells Abraham, hey, Abraham, I want you to pack up your family and move to the place I'm going to send you. And, and Abraham goes home to Sarah and probably says, hey, Sarah, call the movers. We're moving. Where are we moving to? I don't know. God's going to tell us. You know, you see, uh, God tells Noah, hey, Noah, I want you to go and build an ark because it's going to rain, and I'm going to send a flood. And Noah's probably wondering, what's an ark? Never built one before. What, what's rain? Never seen it before. What's a flood? These times of uncertainty, I'm sure they were overwhelmed. You see, God tells Gideon, hey, go fight the enemy with a small army. I'm sure Gideon thought, how are we going to win this battle? God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go, let the Israelites go. And what does Moses say? He's like, God, I can't go. Send somebody else. I'm too afraid. Look at the life of Paul. The Apostle Paul, he shipwrecked, stoned, beaten, persecuted, arrested, condemned. No doubt overwhelmed. No doubt uncertain. But yet what we see is that, yeah, all these people felt overwhelmed. These situations were hard. Yet all throughout God's word, he gives us this promise, I will be with you. He gives us this promise of himself. And each of these situations, what seemed hopeless, God made a way every time God delivered. And he proves to us that his promises are reliable and trustworthy, church. So I'm excited for us to to dig into this because what I want us to see is that the great news of this is that this promise is still available for all of us today. It's available for you. It's available for me. And God wants to lead us to a place where we're not overwhelmed by fear or uncertainty, but to a place where we are free. And to live that life We've got to stand firm on the promises of God. So this morning, I want us to start by looking at this first promise, this incredible promise that God gives us, that no matter what comes our way, God will be with us. So if you have your Bibles open, flip to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41 in your Old Testament. And we're going to camp out with just one verse today. Just one verse. Isaiah 41, verse 10. The prophet Isaiah writes, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. This time for us to come together today and spend time as the church gathered together in these rooms 
singing that you are the God of the promise, that you are the light in the darkness, that nothing will stop it. Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity for us to, to be reminded that your promises are true, that your word is good, and that we can live our lives on it. We can cling to it to see that you have given your life for us so that we can live a brand new life, a life where we're not tied to uncertainty, a life where fear is not our outcome, but it's freedom. Father, today we, we lift up our hearts to the people in Sri Lanka who lost their lives and families that were affected last week as more than 250 of our brothers and sisters in Christ lost their lives last year on Easter morning as they gathered to celebrate the empty tomb. Religious terrorists, Lord, um, came in and bombed churches in Sri Lanka, Lord, and our hearts were just ripped out of our chests as we learned of this news. So, Father, I just pray for peace and encouragement and courage for all of those families that were affected. Lord, I pray that you use this situation to show the world that we have our hope in Jesus Christ and that you can knock us down, you can try to, to, to scare us away, Lord, but we're going to keep coming back every time because Jesus has saved us to a brand new life and our power is not in ourselves, but it's in him. So we pray for all those families in Sri Lanka that lost loved ones. And Lord, we pray that your name is glorified through the situation and that people come to know the saving grace of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we continue to pray for the family of Brian and Rebecca Smith as Rebecca's mom has passed away and, and she's now with you in heaven, Lord. And we just pray for comfort and for encouragement for their family. Help us to love on them as a church. Father, I pray that uh, in this room today, we're still battling lots of sickness, Lord, things going on. We're, we're gearing up for the end of the school year, Lord. I just pray that you give us endurance to make it through uh, a stressful season of the year, Lord, and help us keep our eyes focused on you and our hearts surely, surely planted on the promises of your word. And so, Father, guide us as we spend time here today and show us how you would have us live. It's in Jesus' strong name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 So here we are in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Well, church, I want to be honest for a moment. How many of you in this room have made a promise before? Hands up if you made a promise. If, you, if, you, if your hand's not up, your arm must be broke, right? We've all made promises. All right. Now, if you have broken a promise, keep your hand up. Okay, if your arm's not up, it's really broke. So I think we've all made promises, and we've all broken promises. And, and I don't think we mean to break promises. Like, we like to make promises, but I think we overpromise sometimes. And, and we have a, a failure to keep these promises partially because of our humanity. I mean, we're just, we're, we're broken. We've, we've got sin that has entered, that is in our lives. It's running through our veins, and it leads us to overpromise and underdeliver. And I, and I think sometimes we don't mean to break promises, but we do. But, but here's what I want us to see over these next seven weeks, church that God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. Amen? See, God makes promises, but, but he keeps them. See, God's nature is unfallible, which means he never fails. And all of the promise God makes to us, he keeps. And we see that over and over again through God's word, that he makes a promise and he keeps his word and he gives them to us so we can live our lives on the firm foundation of those promises. See, and this, this morning I want to look at this amazing promise, the greatest promise, the promise of God's presence. Back in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, um, if you know the story, Moses had, had led the Israelites out of Egypt and so now they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And after that, Moses uh, leads them to the promised land, but Moses doesn't get to enter the promised land. Moses dies. And so God comes to Joshua, and Joshua is now appointed leader over Israel. And God tells Joshua, okay, Joshua, it's time for you to lead my people into the promised land. And I can't imagine just how out of his mind Joshua had to be in this moment. Here's a million people that Joshua now has to lead into a land where battles are to be fought where new cities are to be taken over, and a lot of uncertainty. And I'm sure Joshua in that moment thought to, myself, thought to himself, how am I going to do this? How is this going to work out? It's a lot like at work if you get a promotion or maybe you get a new job and now you're managing some people and you wonder, well, how am I going to do this? What's this going to look like? Maybe I'm a little uh, anxious because it's uncertain. Just take that feeling times a thousand, right? He's got a million people he's got to lead to the promised land. But look what God tells Joshua in chapter 1, verse 9. God says this. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. He, said, he tells Joshua, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We see this great promise. 
this great promise of God that no matter where you go, I am with you. It's the promise of his presence. It's so good, church. I want us to see that it's a promise that we need to cling to and make ours. See, when you look at all the promises of the Bible, the promise of God's presence is mentioned more than all of the others. It's funny, if you think about it, the greatest promise in the Bible isn't blessing, it's not reward, it's not patience, it's presence. It's God's presence. And this is what's so beautiful about, about Isaiah chapter 41. A little context about this verse before we dig in. So in Isaiah 41, Isaiah is writing to the Jews and he's telling them, hey, here's what's going to happen you guys are, are not faithful to God and bad times are coming, so get your act right. That's what basically Isaiah is saying. But then Isaiah is prophesying that someday Babylon's going to come in here and he's going to exile the Jews to Babylon. And we see that he's writing about 180 years before the Babylonians came. And it all worked out the way Isaiah said. Babylonians came, they exiled the Jews to Babylon for 70 years. And Isaiah's writing 180 years before that saying, hey guys, here's what's going to happen. Some scary days are going to come. A lot of uncertainty is going to come. A lot of fear is going to be what you're going to experience. But don't be afraid because I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back home. And I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And so God, God gives this amazing promise in Isaiah 41 but I want to see this promise is also meant for us, church. It's meant for you, and it's meant for me. See, God gives us his promise to, uh, to free us from our fears and our uncertainty. Because the truth is, in a room this size, I'd say we've got a lot of us in different seasons of fear and uncertainty right now. Un uncertainty when it comes to family or jobs, or our health, or our finances, school stress as we finish the semester, relationships. There's a ton of uncertainty in our lives right now, but what this promise tells us is that God doesn't say that he's here to help us. God says, I will help you. I will be with you. And see, this is, what, this is why that's important. Because when we find seasons of uncertainty in life, we don't need a maybe. We need a I will. Amen, church? We don't need a well, it could be possible. We need real rescue from God. What we need is God's, God's presence in our lives. And so this morning, I want to dig into Isaiah 41. John Piper, if you know John Piper, um, pastor up in Minneapolis, he, 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 writing about this verse, Isaiah 41, he says that Isaiah expresses God's presence to us in five different ways. And this is really cool as we break this verse down. What, Isaiah, what, what Piper says is that, that God's promise to be with us is expressed to us in five ways. To be by us, to be by you, over you, inside you, around you, and underneath you. Think about that. He covers us completely. Every angle, God is with us. That's a 360 degree protection on both sides. And I just want us to think about how amazing that promise is. That God says, I'm not just here. He's like, I'm with you. I'm with you every step of the way. It's an amazing promise, and I want us to see, church, that we need to cling to this promise, and this promise needs to be ours. We need to claim it, because God's promised to be with us. So, if you have Isaiah 41 opened, let's look back at verse 10, and let's dig on it just a little bit. So, Isaiah says here in verse 10, starting off, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. God says, for I am with you. And so, Piper says, that means that God is by your side. This means that God is by your side. So church, if you were to go home today and add up the commands we read in the Bible, go home and open your Bible up, add up all the commands, you're going to see that God tells us to do not fear, do not or do not be afraid 365 times in the Bible. And one for every day, that's a reminder we need, amen? We need one every day. But it's interesting, in, in the Gospels, Jesus tells us 21 times to do not be afraid, to take courage, to do not lose heart. 21 times Jesus tells us this. And what's funny is interesting, Jesus only tells us to love our neighbor eight times, but he tells you to do not be afraid 21 times. Why such a focus on fear? Why such a focus on not being afraid? Well, I, I think it, it's this, because fear is a major threat to us. Fear is a major threat to where we look. And this is why we need this promise of Isaiah 41.10, that God is by your side. This is why we need to know this truth that God is by our side. Because if we want to live the life that God has created us for, we have to fight fear with God's promises, church. 
That's how we stand firm, is by the promise that God is by our side, by standing on that promise. I love what Jesus says in John 16, verse 33. He says that in the world you will have tribulation, in the world you'll have uncertainty, in the world you're going to have fear, but Jesus says, take heart. Why? He says, because I have overcome the world. And Jesus says, I am with you. I'm with you. He doesn't say, oh, there's nothing to worry about. He doesn't say, well, you're not going to have any problems now that you know me. It's all lollipops and, and the candy canes after you place your faith in me. No, he says, you know what? You're going to have a lot of junk that comes your way, but in the midst of it, don't be afraid, don't fear. Why? Because I'm with you. I got this. It's the presence that he promises. Many of you are familiar with Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm, where David says that God is my shepherd, right? The good shepherd. But I love what David says in the 23rd Psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I love this imagery that God is walking with us, that he is our shepherd, that he's walking along our side. It's so good. It's just a reminder that that's what we need. We need the good shepherd to lead us. But I love what he says in verse 4. Look at verse 4. He says, And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I mean, what a, what a beautiful promise that God gives us that he's going to be with us. And David here is relying on that promise. See, David isn't saying that he's not going to face scary stuff. If you've looked at David's life, he faced scary stuff all the time. That's all he did, pretty much. But he says that when I walk through the shadows, when I walk through the valley of life that we all walk through, I'm not going to be afraid because God is with me. So I think the reality for each of us in this room is that we're going to walk through shadows. Some of you may be in the shadow right now. Others of you are getting out of a shadow or getting ready to go into another one. It's a reality of life that there are these shadows that cast themselves on our lives. And they're scary. And it's dark. That health scare, that mistake at work, those family challenges, those shadows sneak in and they begin to make us scared and they steal our joy. But when these times hit, we have to realize that that's normal. Like, that's normal life. That's part of being a human. That's part of living on planet Earth in a fallen world, that shadows are going to come. But when shadows do come, we've got to be like David. We've got to say, God, you're not, I know you're not going to remove the shadow necessarily, but we know you're going to be in it with me. That's a reminder we need to take to heart. Because I think sometimes we get in the shadows, and we think, well, God, you just don't care anymore. Or God, where are you? Do you not love me anymore? Did I do something wrong? We have this fear that gets built up. Now we start to feel like we're so far from God because the shadow is just so dark. But God is saying over and over again, I'm right here. I'm all around you. Deuteronomy 31.6, he says he'll never leave us. He will never forsake us, church. That is a promise to stand on. That's a promise to stand on. About a month ago, Court and I were outside with Emma, our oldest, and you know, we're, we've been working for, with Emma for a long time to teach her to ride without training wheels. So we had the training wheels off, and we were riding with Emma, and I'm holding on to the back of the bike, you know, and you're kind of running along. And every time I'd let go and she'd start to get up a little speed, she'd get scared because I wasn't holding on anymore. You know, and you do the old dad trick, like, oh, no, I'm still holding, I'm still holding, right? You got, like, your finger on the back. But as she started going, it, 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 was, it was cool. I start, I, as she started getting confidence, I just kind of stepped to the side, and I jogged alongside the bike with her. And as she would topple, I'd kind of grab the bike and straighten it out. And it was amazing to see her gain confidence as I ran next to her. She started just pedaling and pedaling and pedaling. And next thing you know, she's starting and stopping on her own. She's not stopping very well yet, but she's starting okay on her own. So watch out if you see her on the sidewalk. You might get taken out. But it was amazing to see how, God's conf- or how confidence grew in her, knowing that I'm just running right there next to her, getting a good little workout. See, that's the confidence that God wants us to know. He says, look, The valley is going to come. The shadows are going to come, but I'm going to be with you in this. I'm going to comfort you in this. I'm going to walk alongside you in this. And this is the promise that we need to claim, that when life hits the fan, when the bike starts to topple, God's with us. He's going to straighten us out. He's going to be there for us. So I love what Isaiah says here, that God is by our side. But look look back at Isaiah 41.10. He says, do not fear. He also says, do not be dismayed. It's a word we don't use very much. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. What does this mean? This means that, that God is over you. He's our God. He said, don't be dismayed. I am over you. 
This word dismayed, I, I challenge each of you to use that word this week sometime. Dismayed means to be broken and filled with fear. So if you've ever been in one of those situations in life when you just feel like you're in this state of alarm, like you're just spinning in circles, like everywhere people are shooting arrows at you, if you've ever been in one of those moments, that's what it feels to be dismayed. And you just feel like, man, there's uncertainty coming from every direction. But see, in Isaiah, God is saying, don't be dismayed. Know this. I'm your God. I'm bigger than all of this. I'm over you. So I want you to ask yourselves, be, and be honest. When life challenges come, when uncertainty comes, when you guys start to face issues, where do you look? Where do you turn your attention to? Do you, do you look to yourself and try to muster up enough strength to overcome the challenge? Maybe you look to a, a parent or a friend for, for guidance and strength. Sometimes we just end up looking down because we don't want to look up, right? Because we know the situation's ugly. So where do we look? Do we look up to God? I, I think as part of clinging to this promise, learning to trust God, we need to learn to keep our eyes on him because fear wants to steal your attention. Every time, fear wants to steal your attention away, but God says, don't be afraid. Instead, look to me. Uh, a, a chapter before in Isaiah 40, if you have your Bibles open, you can flip to Isaiah 40, verses 25 and 26. God asks a great question, but as God always does, he answers his own question. He says in Isaiah 40, verse 25, To whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He's talking about the stars. He's talking about the heavens. He says, who created these? He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Here, here's what God's saying. He's saying, why would you look anywhere but to me? Why, when trouble comes, would you look to anything else but me? He says, just walk outside and look up. He says, everything you see, I made. Everything you see in the night sky, I placed there. And by the way, I know every name, of every star and every planet, of every galaxy and every black hole in the universe. And so what God is saying is when, when you have trouble that hits, don't look down, look up, look to me, because I am your God. I am control, I am in control of everything. I don't know about you guys, but I like to go out to the mountains and be out at night and just look up at the stars. Anybody else out there? Just like to look up at the stars. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. So astrologers estimate that there's 100,000 million, you get that? 100,000 million, do the math on that one, stars in the Milky Way alone. So in the visible universe that we see, they estimate that there are 70 million, million, million stars. That's a 70 with 21 zeros behind it. It's big. Get your calculator out. Try to do that. Also, turn it over and say hello to your friend while, you're, while you guys were there. <laughs> it's also thought that there are 10 times more stars than there are grains of sand in the beaches and the deserts on earth. Think how many stars that is. And you know what God is saying? I made that. That's me. That's how big I am. So why are you worried about this when I made that? So God says, trust me. I know each of these by name. I care about you. That's what God wants us to see. So God says, hey, when life gets fearful, don't look down, look up. Look to me. Look to me in all these things. So in times of discouragement, he wants us to walk outside and look up at the stars. David says in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God. And when we look up, we were reminded that God loves us so much. He gave his son for us, church to save us to a brand new life. And when we place our faith in Jesus, that brand new life is ours. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be fearful because we know God is with us and helps us to see that God is bigger than our debt. He's bigger than our finances. He's bigger than our rap sheet. He's bigger than our addictions. He's bigger than our broken relationships. He is bigger than our work problems. He's bigger than our loneliness. He's bigger than the pressure that we feel. God is with us each step of the way. So here's my challenge to you guys this week. Drive out into the foothills. Get out from the glow of the city and look up. Pick a nice clear night and look up and just see how big God is. He's so big and he's so, so beautiful. So, so Isaiah says that God is by us, that God is over us, but Isaiah also says that God is in us. Look back, Isaiah 41. He says, fear not, be not dismayed. I will strengthen you. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be in panic mode. I will give you strength. So here's what he's saying, that God is going to strengthen us from the inside. 
That, that God is not, over, not just by us and over us, but he's in us. He's going to strengthen us from the inside. In the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that when we place our faith in Jesus, we've obtained an inheritance, a heavenly inheritance, and that we have been sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit, that, that God gives us the Holy Spirit as a down payment of heaven. Now, how all that works and comes together, you know, it's, it's kind of a bit of a mystery. But, but here's, what God tell, here's what Paul tells us in Ephesians 1.19. He says that God's immeasurable greatness is giving power to us through the Holy Spirit. That we now have this power because of the Holy Spirit. That this, empower, this power is living in us now. The Holy Spirit is in our hearts. Yet I, I think for most of us, we will admit in those moments of uncertainty that we don't feel very powerful. Right? You get to that moment in life when it's uncertain, you don't know what's going to happen, you're worried, you're scared, you don't feel very powerful. And again, you're wondering, God, where are you? But here's what God is saying, church. This is awesome. Think about this. God is saying, I'm not just here. I'm in here. Like, I'm in you. Literally. I reside in you. So you may, not, you may not feel me. There might not be a tickle or a burning, but I'm there. And I'm with you every step of the way. There's a really cool verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul talks about how we are like fragile clay jars who have inside of us the most amazing thing, the most amazing treasure. He said in, in verse 7, but we have the treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Paul says that we, we, we are these clay jars that are chipped and cracked and worn out, yet we have this amazing treasure inside of us, the Holy Spirit. And that when the Holy Spirit moves in our lives, it's proof that it's God's power and not ours. And it helps us to trust because we can look back and see that God has been at work. That you see that God has brought us through the shadows and the valleys over and over again. It's proof that it's God's power and not ours. I think sometimes we think, well, if I have the Holy Spirit inside of us, shouldn't I not feel this pressure or anxiety anymore? I mean, if, if God gives me this power, why do I still feel this pressure? But yet having God inside of us doesn't mean that we're not going to feel pressure. It just means that God's going to give us the strength to stand in the pressure, to stand in the gap. You know, I, I, just, I can't imagine like the, the, the pressure, the uncertainty, the fear that Paul faced. He went through so much, yet Paul says that we're afflicted, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we don't despair. We get struck down, but we're not destroyed. See, Paul isn't saying that we're going to be George Foreman and that nobody's going to knock us down. If you guys remember George Foreman, the old boxer, the guy was a stud. You could hit him and hit him and hit him, and he'd just smile at you and give you a grill. But, you know, you couldn't knock the guy down. he would tell you how to cook a hamburger or a piece of chicken, but you couldn't knock him down. But see, God doesn't say, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you fall. He says, I'm going to give you the strength to get back up. As my dad used to say, the true measure of a person is not how many times you get knocked down, but that you get back up every single time. Life's going to knock us down, church. It's going to happen a lot. But God is going to help us get back up. The Holy Spirit doesn't turn us into Captain Marvel or Mr. Incredible, but it gives us the ability to get back up every time. So that, that, that pressure you feel right now in, this, in the shadow, that's human nature. That's natural. But your, your, your circumstances don't define you. God does. Amen? Your identity in Christ defines you, not the pressure you feel. And so it's a comfort to know that God is in us, working inside of us. Look back at Isaiah 41. Not is God also in us, but God is all around us. He says in 41.10, fear not, be not dismayed, I will help you. He says he's going to help us. This means that God is all around us. When I was a kid, I had a chance to go see uh, President Ronald Reagan. I was a little kid. President Ronald Reagan came through my hometown. And so we went out. It was a school day. My parents took me out. We, went, we were standing on the sidewalk. And Ronald Reagan drove down in his old school presidential motorcade. And I, it was really cool. It's my one claim to fame. Reagan looked right at me and gave me a thumbs up. I was like, man, that's cool. That's really cool. That's the only time I've ever got a thumbs up. It's the only time I've actually ever seen a president. But it was really good. But if you've ever seen a presidential motorcade, you know that there's police cars in front, police cars behind. There are police and secret service all up and down the side of the roads. Nowadays, they have helicopters and snipers on the side of the road. You guys don't want to mess around when there's a presidential motorcade around. It's, a, it's like a 360-degree detail, protection detail. 
And, and you almost wonder, like, why all the protection? Well, because they cannot predict exactly what's going to happen. They know that there could be some uncertainty, so they have to be ready on all sides. And that's what God tells us. He says that when I am with you, that my promise to be with you means I'm going to be ready. I'm going to put a 360-degree protection detail around you at all times. He says in Psalm 139, he says, um, well, the psalmist writes, You search me out, and my laying down are acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand on me. So the psalmist is saying, God, you are all around me. You are above me on the sides. You are all around me. And that God is going to protect our blind side like a good left tackle protects the quarterback. God is all around us. But the, the psalmist is also saying that God goes before us. See, sometimes we feel like we're in the wilderness and we just feel like we're wandering. God's saying, look, I'm preparing the way to the promised land. You just need to follow me. You just need to trust me. I think it's amazing to know this, that, that God is all around us. He's by us, over us, in us, around us. But the most amazing part of this promise is the last, um, the last part of this verse in, in 41.10. Look what he says. I think this is the greatest part of the promise, that God is not just over us, around us, and by us, but he's underneath us. He's actually holding us. He says in Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, do not be dismayed, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. This means, church, that God is underneath us. That God is upholding us. He's holding us up. That no matter how far we fall, no matter how long it feels like we've been falling, that God's there. He's going to catch us. He's there for us. See, here's the great part of the promise that we need to take a hold of. See, God's promise is that when we fall or when we hit rock bottom or what feels like rock bottom, that he is there, that we're going to find out that his arms have been there the entire time. He's just been asking us to step out and jump. He's been asking us to be faithful. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says that the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. Isn't that beautiful? Everlasting arms. No matter how far, how wide, how deep, God's arms are there, church to catch us. It's a beautiful picture. D.L. Moody says that God never made a promise that was co too good to be true. I think sometimes that sounds too good to be true. Like, God, you're really, really there? You're really going to catch me if I fall? The uncertainty leads us to fear, and instead of stepping out and jumping, we just hide in the cage, we lock the door. But God says, no, I'm here. Step out. Trust me. One of the outdoor sports that fascinates me is rock climbing. I don't know about you guys, but um, rock climbing is just incredible. It's really fascinating. And if you guys are fans of rock climbing, you probably know the name of Tommy Caldwell. Tommy's a world-renowned rock climber. And back in January of 2015, Tommy and his buddy Kevin Jorgensen set out to do something that's never been done. They set out to, so to, to climb an area of rock on El Capitan in Yosemite National Park, a, a, a rock climber's destination. They set out to, to climb an area that's never been climbed before called the Don Wall. And they recently put out a documentary called the Don Wall, and I won't spoil it for you. It's amazing. You need to go watch it. But it, it is incredible when you begin to look at these rock climbers because you, you, you see that they have such a trust in their equipment. Um, in, in the Don Wall, what you'll see is that for 19 days, Tommy and Kevin lived on the side of El Capitan hanging from the rock face, sleeping in tents. For, for 19 days. 3,000 feet of granite. These guys are, are hanging on a hook, living in a tent. <laughs> it's incredible. But one of the most amazing things you find out when you, when, you, when you hear their stories and you learn about rock climbing is that these guys, they, they know there's risk. I mean, they, they know there's risk, but they're comfortable and secure stepping out on the rock because they are confident that their ropes and their harnesses and their anchors are going to hold. They are so confident. They've done it so many times. They have, they have gone up and down the face of the rock so many times that they're confident that they, their knots are going to hold, that the ropes they use are going to hold, that their harnesses are tight, and those anchors are secure. And it gives them the strength to step out in the most scary of circumstances and hang off a 3,000-foot rock, sure death below you, and know that if they slip or if they lose their hold, they're going to fall, but that rope is going to catch them and they're going to land with their feet against the rock. And church, when I read the promise that God has given us here in Isaiah 41.10, that's what God has promised us. That when we anchor ourselves to him, 
That when we are anchored to Jesus, God promises to catch us when we fall. That when we navigate our, we try to navigate through the rocks of life, we're going to slip. We're going to lose our hold. But when we're anchored to God, he's going to catch us every time. Amen, church? It's an amazing promise. It's an amazing promise. And we may feel like we're falling a long way when we do. But we know that no matter how far we fall, God is going to catch us. But yet, just like a good rock climber does, we have to know our equipment. We have to be familiar with the tools that God has given us. See, God gives us some amazing tools, church, like his word. And he gives us this tool so we can learn the promises, so we can learn to trust what he says is true, so we can see over and over again that he delivers over and over again. But yet he gives us prayer. He gives us prayer as a tool to use for the promises of God. Because when we come to him in prayer, we're asking him to help prepare us for those seasons when uncertainty hits so we learn to trust him and who he is. I like what Charles Spurgeon says. He says that the best praying man is the man who most believe, is most believingly familiar with the promises of God. After all, prayer is nothing but taking God's promises to him and saying to him, do as you have said. Prayer is the promise utilized. A prayer which is not based on a promise has no true foundation. God has given us these amazing tools, these amazing promises, and he's just telling us to trust him, to step out, to cling to those promises, to make those promises our foundation. And each of us are here today left with a question, are we going to trust him? Are we going to step out and trust him? Psalm 20 verse 7 says that some trust in chariots and some horses, some trust in ropes and anchors, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Church, God has made us this amazing promise, this promise of his presence, and he invites us on this amazing journey. But to be able to trust him, we have to know him. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because if you do, this promise of his presence that's your promise, church. Claim it. Let it be yours and trust that God is going to walk with you every step of the way. So church, over the course of these series, I want to challenge you. Here's a challenge. I want to challenge you to find a promise. Find a life promise. There's 7,000 of them in the Bible, so you have a lot to choose from. But find one. For me, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. What's it going to be for you? I encourage you this week to dive into your Bibles. Go online and look up the promises of God and find one to stand on and to cling to. Church, it's my prayer that as we learn to trust God's word, as we learn to cling to the promises of God, we will step out of the cage, we'll unlock the doors, and we will trust that no matter what life throws at us, God's promise of his presence is with us. Amen, church. Would you pray with me?